You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. The Rosary, chief weapon of a spiritual warrior with Father Calloway. Welcome everyone to Polly Pat. Polly Pat is back. We've got a special guest today, Father Donald Calloway. Welcome, Father, to the podcast. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for having me. It's awesome. Yes. Yeah. And I recently had the privilege of interviewing Father Calloway on my podcast on Consecration to St. Joseph, your new book. Um, but as the month of October approaches, as we're about to enter that, and that's the month of the rosary, I thought, I want to have him back on and I want Pat to join in on the conversation so we can talk about the rosary um, because you have another book called champions of the rosary. And um, so, yeah, just give us a little background on who you are for those who may not be familiar and uh, what inspired you to write that book. And and more importantly, what inspired you to have a devotion to our lady and, and the rosary? Yeah, so, well, I'm a convert to Catholicism. I converted 27 years ago. Um, and I had a radical conversion. A lot of people know me because of that, from being the bad guy in my teen years and, uh, into my early, you know, early twenties and then, um, having a radical conversion. And then I got my vocation and I've been ordained a priest now for 17 years. So I, I am the vocation director for my religious community, the Marian fathers. And I write books. I lead pilgrimages and, um, I've been doing a lot of the pilgrimage stuff of late because of the COVID thing, but uh, I'll hopefully get back into it soon. Um, Yeah, so the rosary for me was actually a huge part of my conversion. So those familiar with my story, they know that uh, after I read a book about Our Lady, I went to a Catholic church and uh, I witnessed some of the Filipino women doing some weird (laughs) thing. You know, I, I had no idea what these women were doing. I thought it was rather odd, to be honest, my first experience. All I knew was that these women all had, had, were holding up like some kind of necklace thing that they all brought out of their purse. Right. And they were doing some incantation. That's what I thought, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, of course it was the rosary and, they took me under their wing and they taught me the rosary, these Filipino women, God bless them. And uh, the rosary became my daily companion. Wow. I mean, to this day, um, I, I, it's very rare that I miss a day of praying the rosary. I mean, it, I have to be like really, really sick or something. <laughs> it's just, it's extremely rare. And I've been doing that for 27 years. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, this is so important to me. And that's why I wrote six books on the rosary. Yikes, uh, wow. six books. Wow, that's yeah, incredible. Six, yeah, so I just love it. And I want other people to know about it and to do it, whether individually or as a husband and wife, as a family, priest in their parish. Mm-hmm. I just think it's a way to bring about so much good and bring us closer to Christ. Yeah, uh, beautiful. So since this will be uh, the first time that people may be hearing of you on my podcast. Now, I am familiar with your story. I think I first um, saw an interview with you on EWTN and, and you're right. It's, uh, uh, it, it, first off, everybody loves a good villain story. So could you give us the, uh, <laughs> especially when there's redemption at the end of it, at least, could you give us just a quick condensed version of how you, how you wound up, uh, not just in the Catholic church, but even a Catholic priest? Yeah. Well, I mean, my, this is the funny part is none of my family was Christian. Um, and so, I actually am the reason that my parents became Catholic because I drove them nuts and they needed God, you know, so they had a conversion um, and I thought they joined a cult. I had no idea what the Catholic church was. I thought, great, my parents have been suckered into some medieval archaic, you know, institution that hates science and is against everything modern. That's what I thought because I was educated by the world. And well, obviously I was dead wrong about everything. Um, So after they had their conversion, I had my conversion. And, um, it was fast. I mean, it was, it was, I went from drugs and alcohol abuse and a very immoral life to and the Japanese know, mafia. Yeah. I mean, I was in Japan involved with the Japanese mafia, the Yakuza, yeah, um, a, little, a little mafia here and there. Again. You know what I mean? Mix it yeah. in. Yeah. I know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So my, my conversion was pretty hardcore and, um, I, it didn't take long 
before I, I discerned that God was calling me to be a priest. And I didn't know where, because there's a ton of religious communities, there's dioceses all over the place. So I was like, where? All I knew was I loved the Blessed Virgin Mary. So I looked for a community that was really focused on her. And I ended up finding the Marian fathers. And I was like, wow, this is great. It's even in their name. So uh, they somewhat reluctantly took me because of my past and rightly so. Mm -hmm. And my formation was long. Remember, I was, I've been a Catholic 27 years, but I've been a priest 17. So there was 10 year period where I had, to, I had to really learn everything over again. And that was good. I needed it. So mm -hmm. that's um, the, the shortest version of it. And the rosary was from those Filipino ladies, um, you know, up until today has been a huge part of it. It really and truly is. I mean, this has kept me, wow. you know, on the straight and narrow. And even when I do mess up, you know, this holding our lady's hand in this rosary gets me to confession. It gets me, you know, where I need to be again, because I'm human like everybody else. I make mistakes. And so, um, brothers, this to me is just, it's huge. It's absolutely yes. huge. Yes. Oh, wow. From, so I, I too am, am a convert. So is my wife. She has, a. Uh, a very tender devotion to Our Lady. She is the the one who really keeps the whole family praying the rosary every single night. Um, she's she's up usually at four thirty a.m. or so. She usually gets in you know four rosaries a day. Um, she, so she's a she's a convert as well. So there was a, a big pull um, from Our Blessed Mother to for my wife too. So she's gonna. In fact, she's gonna share this on her podcast too. She'll <laughs> you'll be making the rounds here, wow. Father Father Calloway for sure. But wow, from the from the Japan, I've heard a number of conversion stories, but you don't typically hear from the Japanese mafia to a Catholic priest. That's a, that's definitely up there. That's a, that's pretty novel. I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, it's unique. That's for sure. And the cool thing, check this out, is you know that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm supposed to hopefully I'll be able to do this in light of world situation. I've got my uh, invitation to come back to Japan next year to speak. So wow. I haven't been back since I got, I got literally kicked out of the country. So, um, I want to, I want to make a shirt that says back in black, you know? yes. <laughs> put some tornado, Yokohama, Tokyo, put some tornado. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, so exiled from Japan out of the mafia and now you'll be making your glorious return. I love it. With, yes. Uh, With your chief weapon in hand. Okay. So, Riddle me this just real quick from your own life, praying the rosary now for gosh, I guess 27 years. Mm -hmm. um, what have been some of the positive fruit that you've experienced in your own life? I mean, you mentioned it keeps you on the straight and narrow, but what are some things yeah. that you've experienced or even miracles that you've experienced by just praying the rosary on that daily basis? Yeah, for me, it's been therapeutic because you know, even though I'm a priest and I love the Lord and all of that, I live in a world that is just constantly throwing distractions at me, whether it's this latest device or this program you want to binge watch, you know, and or whatever it is, this thing just helps me to refocus. And I mean, really and truly, 20 minutes a day to pray, you know, just one set of mysteries is not asking a lot. I mean, we waste more time on social media, sometimes in the bathroom, you know, 20 minutes. So, we can do this, you know, and for me, it's that therapy of, of helping me to be a better man, to be a good priest, and um, it gives me peace, you know, because mm. there's, there's a lot of friction in everybody's life. I get into arguments with people, we have conflict, a, a meeting comes up, and I'm like, uh, this is going to be rough, you know, something's going to have to be So I, when I pray, the book, I just find that um, I'm more compassionate, I'm more um willing to, 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 to work with people. I don't have a chip on my shoulder. I don't go in guns blaring, you know, you know, it just, it helps me to be the man that I think our Lord and our lady want me to be. Um, and that's, and I, and brothers, I know if I go without praying it, uh, which is very rare, but you know, on occasion there is a day that I'll miss. I, I, I feel the difference. Wow. I'm like, I, I didn't pray my rosary, you know? Yeah. And maybe the um, before we get into the history of the rosary, just describing what exactly are we talking about? What is the rosary to someone who has never heard the term before? We yeah. mentioned our beads. I got mine here, um, which is a third class relic because it was in the Holy Land with me, touched where Jesus died and rose again, which is kind of cool. Uh, so nice. I keep it close to my chest. Um, but yeah, so what, what is the rosary? 
Yeah, so it's basically a form of portable prayer. It can be prayed anywhere. And, you know, you're, you're basically praying the New Testament. It's the Bible on a set of beads because almost mm-hmm. the entire prayer, you know, 90% of the prayers on the rosary come right out of the New Testament. It's either the Our Father from the lips of our Lord or the Hail Mary prayer, which is a combination of what St. Elizabeth said when Mary visited her at the visitation and then, you know, what um, uh, the church kind of added a little bit on there during a time, interestingly enough, of a plague, uh, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death in the 13th century, uh, 14th century. So it's kind of fascinating in light of the times we're living in. Yes. Um, and then we, with the glory be, we're praying basically what the angels said, you know, glory to God in the highest. Um, and it's just a beautiful prayer where you meditate upon mysteries of the life of our Lord, right out of the New Testament, and you meditate upon that. And that is to make a pilgrimage, really mm-hmm. and truly. When you, you know, you don't, if you can't go to the Holy Land, for example, or you can't go to Italy, or you can't go to Lourdes, or Fatima, or Guadalupe, hey, 20 minutes a day, you can make a pilgrimage in your mind and your heart when you pray the rosary, because in your mind and your heart, you're going to the holy sacred places, and you can do this every day. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. Yeah. Free pilgrimage every day. (laughs) Yeah, you're you're making this a a very hot sell. And I love, I love, you know, when it comes to the rosary, explaining it as the the Bible on beads, right? Um, I think that really helps to to connect some, uh, well, or at least to hedge against some common misunderstandings of the rosary, um, whether you're Catholic or you're not Catholic. And I think you've you've highlighted uh, the proper understanding here is is it's 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 a way to really deepen your relationship mm-hmm. and and love of God and Christ and to enter into the mysteries that we find in the gospel. So there was actually a little booklet that my wife got when we were first coming into the church from Amazon. Maybe maybe you know this one and may, maybe you recommend it. Uh, maybe we can link it alongside your books as well. It's called How to Pray, Not Just Say the Rosary. Mm. Uh, and that and that was helpful for me because it's same thing like you, Father Callaway. When I first encountered the rosary, I'm like, what is, what is this witchcraft that people have here? <laughs> this, this, ghoulish, this ghoulish device or whatever. It made very little sense to me. Yeah. Um, but then, uh, or or you know, as you as you, I, another I guess common misunderstanding is it's just sort of just this very mechanical, dry, tedious. Uh, I guess prescription for for penance that you see in like an old Hollywood movie after somebody gets out of the confessional, right? Like these seem to be like the, some of the common misconceptions. So before we go any deeper, is there anything that you would want to say to to any of those points or a, yeah. any any other common misconceptions that come up that you would want to address beforehand? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, in the Old Testament, we have 150 Psalms, right? And those tend to be very repetitious, and there's nothing wrong with repetition. Repetition is the mother of all learning, right? And repetition is not a bad thing. Just like when you say to your wife, honey, I love you. I guarantee you, your wife is never at any point going to say, stop telling me that. She's going to love that, right? So when you pray this prayer, which is repetitious, but here's the thing. Jesus said, warned us against vain repetition, Mm -hmm. not repetition. Because remember, Jesus himself prayed the Psalms of the Old Testament, where they're very repetitious, um, and Jesus himself in the, in, the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, three times, it says, he went out and did the same thing, prayed, right? Saying the same thing, it says. You can read that in the New Testament. He said the same thing three times. Well, in the rosary, what we're saying to God, you know, is, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. And, and we're meditating upon the saving mysteries of the Messiah, of mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. God is never going to say, Stop telling me you love me and stop thinking about me. <laughs> He's never going to do that. So, I mean, this is why this is so blessed and why so many saints have used it and why the Catholic Church promotes it so highly, you know, because ultimately it's about being madly in love with Jesus Christ. And one thing that I sometimes tell people too is it's, you know, nobody knew Jesus better than the Blessed Virgin Mary. So it's seeing the life of Christ through the eyes of her who knew him best. And it's amazing to team up with the Blessed Mother in someone who is there to reflect on the life of Christ and that life of faith that she had in knowing him um, is is just incredible. Yep, absolutely. That's right. I mean, and, 
you know, that's what so many people have said, saints and popes have said. Um, it's the school of Mary, they basically say, where you get to know Christ and, and you get to fall more in love with him. And, you know, think about it. If you spent 20 minutes a day thinking about something, whether it's learning a language or whatever it is, at some point, you're going to really know it well. Well, that's mm. the same thing with the rosary. The, the focus of the rosary is Jesus. Um, praying that every day, man, you're going to be super close to him. And Our Lady is going to help you with that. Yeah, and I would say don't be discouraged for whoever's listening out there. Because like for me, after it was about a year after I became Catholic that I started praying the rosary. It took me a couple months of praying it each day to where I finally felt like it wasn't boring or a drag. Or, and that I actually loved it, and then I got used to praying it. Because it is a hard thing to learn sometimes at first because you're praying these prayers, but your your mind is meditating on these mysteries, these things. You're trying to really enter those scenes. But I would just say persevere because it's totally worth it. It's my favorite form of prayer now, for sure. Yeah, yeah, mine too. I mean, and, and you're right. You bring up a great point because, you know, a lot of people do get discouraged when they maybe initially start or even after years because you get distracted. Mm. I don't know anybody who's prayed a perfect rosary in the sense of with angelic precision, you pinpoint on the mystery and you get no distractions in your, that's not, that's, we don't have that ability in our mind. We're not angels. We can't just focus on one thing for 20 minutes straight. Um, maybe Padre Pio could, I mean, that's next level holiness, right? But by the way, real quick, since you brought up Padre Pio, we're going to, um, uh, venerate his relics, uh, in just a couple of weeks and, and, we're bringing our rosaries, so they become oh, third class oh, relics. So, oh, that's so, fantastic! So maybe we'll get that angelic precision. Then we'll see, right? <laughs> yeah, Here's <sweet>. the hoping. <laughs> sweet, yeah, because I, you know, I meet a lot of people to say, "Father, I just get distracted." And I'm like, "Normal, that's normal." And what I call that? Remember, I talked about how you know praying the Hail Marys is like saying, "I love you to God. I love you. I love you. I love you." Well, we're like children. We get distracted and we're like, I love you. Squirrel. You know, we look away and we're like, oh, that's right. Let me get back to the mystery. And, but then that's like giving God a butterfly kiss. You ever see a little, a little child giving a parent just smothering with kisses just at random, you know? That's what the praying of the rosary is for us and God. He's like, I know you get distracted. You're all over the place. But you're showing that you love me. I'll take every kiss I, you know, yes. distract, I can get, you know? It's, yeah. That's awesome. So, so, so be patient with yourself. Be kind yeah. with yourself. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, cool. Well, I really want to hear about the history of the rosary from you a little bit. So how did it develop? You know, when did it become popular and, and like how early can we trace the roots of this back? And like, when did it finally become the rosary? Yeah. So what's pretty much affirmed um, in official ways by popes and in official documents is that the tradition is that it was in the 13th century that Our Lady herself gave what we know today as the Rosary to St. Dominic, okay? But there were things that were kind of antecedents to it. Mm -hmm. So there was something called a Marian Psalter, which was a form of praying uh, Hail Marys on beads by monks, because they did the same thing for Our Father beads, Pater Noster beads, and they would do the same thing for, for the, the Hail Mary, but they didn't meditate on anything and they weren't um, using it as a form of meditation or an evangelical tool, so to speak. It was just something that they did uh, a pious practice, which was wonderful. But at a certain time in the 13th century, there was a heresy in France where the St. Dominic lived at that time that was really doing a lot of damage to the church. So he tried his preaching and, 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 and to win him back, but it wasn't having a lot of fruit. Well, that's when tradition says, affirmed by countless popes and official documents and saints, that Our Lady came to him after he made a retreat, and she told him to preach her Psalter. And she equipped him with these mysteries, which were the exact mysteries that this heretical group were attacking, uh, which we would classify as the uh, joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries of the life of Christ. So, what she said to him was, take this pious form of devotion, which didn't have meditations and wasn't an evangelical tool, take it out into the streets and preach about, you know, these things, the joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries to win back these wayward souls. And that's what he did. And so it became a, a form of prayer and 
preaching because he would preach and then he would have them pray the Hail Marys to meditate upon what he had just preached about. So we don't necessarily do that method anymore out in the streets, Hmm. but that's exactly what you're doing when you pray it uh, today by yourself or with others. So it's incredible. Yeah, occasionally you will find, I actually have done some work with a cool apostle at St. Paul Street Evangelization. Wow. And they sent, they do send some, some people out to go pray yeah, the rosary true. in the streets still. Yeah. So I, I wish there, I wish there was more of that. Is that something we as Catholics should get back to? Do you think Father Calloway? Actually, brother, I think this is a great idea because we've got other things that are under threat today and we've been given another set of mysteries mm. to, 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 to preach on, to pray about, because these are the things that are being attacked today. Just like in the 13th century, there were certain things. So, Yes, indeed. This would be this would be great to do. Very cool. Yeah, and so my my understanding too is he was very successful after he uh, Saint Dominic got this from Our Lady, and there are no more Albigensians really. Uh, right. And but then it kind of lay dormant for a while until Blessed Alan de la Roche. Yeah. Um, could you go into that a little bit? And when was that exactly? And what happened with reviving the Rosary? Yeah, to its prominence. Yeah, I mean, like most things that come from heaven, the devil, you know, tries to destroy it or make a mess of it and everything. So right after, shortly after our lady gave the rosary to St. Dominic, um, a plague hit Europe. And yes, there's a, there's a simple human reason for the plague, you know, uh, rats carried it here and there. And yes, for sure. But saints will tell us that there was also a spiritual component to this plague, the black death in the 14th century. So one century after St. Dominic, that, killed i think it's like one third of europe died from the plague oh. and we're talking huge numbers here and um so during that time they weren't necessarily thinking about pious practices they were worried about surviving and so the rosary got forgotten uh in most of europe in england not so much because that was kind of offshore you know the plague hit england too but the rosary was still practiced there um But it was really um, neglected in mainland Europe in a huge way. And that's when, after the plague, um, our Lord, Our Lady, and even St. Dominic began to appear to a Dominican named Father Alan de la Roche at the time, now Blessed Alan de la Roche, telling him, spread it again, because there needs to be a revival of this form of prayer. And so he did. And, I mean, kings joined the confraternity of the rosary, and it's spread everywhere. And uh, since that time, it's never gone into um, what, it, what, it, what happened during that plague. It's, it's been promoted constantly. Yeah. And um, you mentioned earlier that it was during the time of the plague that they added the second half of the Hail Mary. How did that happen? Yeah. You know, the Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. I'm sure death was on people's minds so they could use the extra intercession. That's it. So during that time, as I said, there weren't many people that were praying the rosary, at least not in groups. Um, And the confraternity, you know, founded by St. Dominic, but it it didn't have that name when he found it. It was just an association of prayer. It would get that name later. But the people who were praying it, they were like, okay, we're praying to Our Lady, but we've got a dire situation. Our relatives, our priests, everybody's dying here. And so they formulated this prayer which you just said, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, because we're about to die. Now, that prayer didn't get codified, meaning officially approved by the church, until the 16th century. But it it was being prayed from the time of the plague in the 14th century all the way until Pope St. Pius V codified it and said, stamp, approved, it's now officially part of the Hail Mary, which made it part of the Rosary. So... Yeah, it's a power, ble- or a venerable, I want him to be blessed, and a saint, venerable Fulton Sheen talks about the origins of this in one of his books. Right. So here's a, maybe just to turn up the heat a little bit, how serious is the rosary, would you say, for Catholics? How seriously should Catholics take the rosary? I think you've given us some good historical precedent, but it mm. seems like, I mean, maybe we could even bring Fatima into this. Mm. Um to some extent, which, by the way, I saw there's a new Fatima movie out. I don't know if either of you two have seen that or, or I haven't actually heard much about that yet. But it seems like, again, when Our Blessed Mother appears, that this is something she really emphasizes. Is that, is that right? Oh, 
you nailed it. I mean, it is the thing that she emphasizes. So in almost all of her approved apparitions, starting with Our Lady of Lords, which uh, I think was in 1858, almost all of the subsequent approved Marian apparitions, Our Lady has talked about the rosary, even praying parts of it with some of the visionaries, um, because she's not a sinner, right? So she can't pray the forgive us our sins like in the Our Father. Um, But the three children of Fatima, for example, they were all asked by the adults who were in attendance at these apparitions, what is the most important, the most emphatic theme or idea or thing that Our Lady is saying to you? All three children said, it's the rosary. And, you know, we call that apparition Our Lady of Fatima, and rightly so. But at the last apparition on October 13th, 1917, how did Our Lady identify herself in that apparition? She called herself the Lady of the Rosary. Wow. That's what she said, right? So it's, and, and, and the Basilica in Fatima is called Our Lady of the Rosary. I mean, the whole thing is about the Rosary. And so it's huge. I mean, for me, you know, I can't judge anybody and say, hey, if you're not praying the Rosary, you're not a devout Catholic. I mean, that, that would be too extreme. But I think I can say that if you're not praying the Rosary, or if you have an aversion to the Rosary, there's something not quite clicking yet. I mean, to ha- I mean, St. Louis de Montfort talks about this, is when you draw close to, to our Lord and Our Lady, this is just like, this just comes with it. And this gr- grows you closer to them. It's like an anchor, you know? It's like an anchor. The boat on the seas of the world, it's going to move, but this anchors you. It keeps you grounded close to Jesus Christ. So I think it's vital, and that means life-giving. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I was just going to say St. Louis de Montfort, he's got, he's got some strong words, uh, doesn't he? I mean, just one example kind of made me laugh um, when, reading, when reading what he had to say about the rosaries. He says, just, just praying one rosary, that's a child's rosary, he calls it, right? <laughs> He's, he's, he's kind of calling us to step up our game a little bit. <laughs> he didn't have right. the luminous mysteries. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but still. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go, and, go ahead, Eric. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, he even says, like, it's a sign of the predestinate, those who love Our Lady, um, and sign of the reprobate, those who don't. So that's right. pretty, pretty strong from yeah. St. Louis de Montfort there. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, Our Lady of the Rosary that's interesting because that fir- that title did that first get developed at Lepanto? There was an epic battle right in the 1500s. Um, yeah, 1565, I think. Okay, so what happened there? Like, because that was a huge victory for the Rosary, right? And that like increased yeah. people's faith in in this devotion. Oh, for sure. Um, that's where it really got um, the the claim to fame that we have today. But, I mean, there were battles even before Lepanto where the Rosary won the victory. And those, I mean, I really do encourage people to get the book, Champions of the Rosary, because I did tons of research on this. And there's significant battles that happened before Lepanto where the emphasis was on the Rosary and and it's bringing about the victory. But at Lepanto, where basically uh, Catholicism held back the um, Ottoman Turks, Muslims, from conquering the West— um, and all true historians acknowledge this, that this was a decisive battle. But what they don't see oftentimes is that it was the rosary that brought about the victory. So the church dedicated that victory to Our Lady of Victory. Okay. So at first they didn't call it Our Lady of the Rosary, though everybody knew it, they, they, Our Lady of Victory. But then it became known as Our Lady of the Rosary, and that's where we got that official title. And that's where we ended up getting the feast on October 7th, our Lady of the Rosary. So, yeah, it, the, most people associate it with Lepanto, for sure. And so what, who were some of the key players? Um, I kind of wanted you to mention Blessed Bartolo Longo because he had a devotion to Our Lady of the Rosary and built like a chapel, I believe, in Pompeii. Yeah, um, yeah tell us a little bit about him and any of the other champions of the Rosary. And obviously, yeah. definitely encourage people to get the book because there's – yeah. I don't know how many saints you have in there, but it's a lot, and it's awesome. Very oh, yeah. Scary. So, and, yeah. And this one, I mean, it's a big book, right? I got a ton. 
But then I actually extracted the main ones from that book and put together another book called 26 Champions of the Rosary. Okay. The major players of the Rosary. So, um, so yeah, let's, let's focus on maybe just that blessed Bartolo Longo guy because he's huge. Um, and if, you know, you were hearing my story at the beginning involved in the Japanese mafia, <laughs> I got nothing on blessed Bartolo Longo. This guy fell away from Catholicism. He was Italian. Um, and he ended up becoming an ordained satanic priest. I mean, I never did no junk like that. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> I mean, man, um, I was just drinking sake and having a good time in Japan. This guy was working <laughs> the devil, you know? So, um, so that's how bad it was. So that led to depression. He was thinking about committing suicide. He was all messed up, but then he remembered his Catholicism and he went and talked to a Catholic priest, a Dominican, which is huge. And the Dominican told him, look, this is your way out of the occult. This is your way back to um, Jesus Christ. And so he renounced the occult. He became a third order Dominican. And he began building the world's most famous shrine to the rosary, which is Our Lady of the Rosary of Pompeii in Italy. Mm. And now this guy is blessed. He was beatified in 1980 by St. John Paul II. So if anybody's watching this, listen to this, who has children who are messed up or into new age or the occult, you have an intercessor in blessed Bartolo Longo, <laughs> you know, ask him to, to, to help them to come back to the and, and what an optimistic story. I mean, it really goes to show there are no depths that our Lord cannot retrieve somebody from, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. That's right. It doesn't get worse than worshiping the devil. So it really doesn't, right? That is yeah. like as low as it can possibly get. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now he's a blessed. Wow. <laughs> I know. And I've been to that church, by the way, in Pompeii. Wow. Wow. What a church. I mean, it's like you just walk in, you want to cry. It's gorgeous. That's incredible. Yeah. So um, I'm sorry, Eric, what, if you had something, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, going back to the apparitions and whenever I um, consecrated myself to the Blessed Virgin Mary, it seemed like a natural progression to start praying the rosary more and more just like dedicating my my life to doing that each day because it's like if she's coming from heaven appearing to people saying do this every day and i want to have a devotion to her i should listen to her (laughs) it's kind of how i thought about it so it kind of made sense to me and and obviously I, i don't do it just from an obligation standpoint but just it really is has been the most powerful form of prayer to me as well um sorry pat what were you gonna say there uh, no, I was just, I think that's a great segue. I was going to just transition into the practical because I remember, you know, when, when I was telling Eric this the other day, it's, it's, it's funny kind of looking back because when my wife and I were first coming into the church, just like it, it all seemed so impossible at first. So like the, of all things we're like, we were complaining one morning. It's like, if we become like Christian or Catholic, we're going to have to go to church every Sunday. <laughs> How are we ever going to do that, right? And now uh, now we go to daily mass with our whole family. We pray a nightly rosary. She's up at 4.30 a.m. And, and the point is, is, like I'm not saying that this was done by me. In fact, I'm saying it absolutely wasn't. I'm saying God will go to work on you if you just get stop getting out of your own way in ways that, that you would, would never imagine. And uh, like the one thing that just kind of, I guess, helped for me, and I'd be curious if you endorse this, Father Calloway, and what your recommendation would be for getting people started, is I just remember praying, like, God, help me pray. Like, give me the grace to pray. Like, I had to pray to pray, if that, if that makes sense. Because it, it really did all seem overwhelming for me. I've always had monkey brain. I've always been somebody who's had a very hard time just sitting down focusing on anything. So I knew if this was going to be even in the realm of possibility, I was going to need all the help that I could get. So I just want to say for people who are listening, it feels like this is tough. I get you. <laughs> I've, I've, I've been there. And I just love your, your thoughts on and recommendations for somebody who might be in that position. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I, I would tell people, cause I've met people that have said, all right, I'm going to try it. You know, I've heard these great sermons on it and so, such and such a saint wrote a book about it. So I'm going to do it. And then they get discouraged because they find it difficult or the time and all of the, you know, busy all right. Okay. Understandable. Baby steps. Hey, do a decade a day. That'll take you about two or three minutes. You know what I mean? Um, you can do that. You know, you can do that and build up just like lifting weights. You don't go in there right off the bat and just start bench pressing like massive, you know, okay. If you just do a decade, that's fine. And just keep building up. And I often tell families, you know, cause families are like, Oh father, we always hear, you know, people saying even popes pray the family rosary. 
but it's so tough for our family because one child has Asperger's, for example, or one child is just all over the place and, you know, just throwing crayons and everything. It's like, look, God understands. So, you know, if you only do a decade with your family and maybe you do the whole rosary on Sundays or a solemnity, God understands these things. And, and if you have to allow your children during the rosary to draw the mystery, you know, little Anna, as we're praying this annunciation, draw it you with your crayons. That's fine. That, there's creative ways that you can do this. And heaven understands that. And um, yeah, the, I think the key thing is to just try, mm-hmm. you know, just try. And I tell people too, look, if you're driving to work, you know, pray the rosary. Um, if you're taking a walk, your dog for a walk, pray the rosary. You know, there's mm-hmm. little ringed rosaries. You don't have to you know, publicize it. Hey, everybody on my block, I'm praying the rosary now as I'm walking my dog. There's a little ring. You can have your hand in your pocket. Nobody knows that you're walking with God at that moment, praying the rosary. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just, you know. just want to say how much I uh, appreciate all that, but especially I think the analogy to exercise is actually a really, really good one. It's, a, it's quite a tight analogy. Obviously, the rosary has a spiritual significance. Well, we could say exercise has a spiritual significance as well, I guess. But in the sense that you first start working out, it's tedious, it's difficult, but if you take the baby steps, you not only become consistent, you develop the habit, but then working out goes from being this tedious thing you don't enjoy to something that if you don't enjoy it, then you feel, if you don't do it, then you feel agitated, right? You, yeah, you, you yeah. feel bad when you don't do it. So there's this, there's this flip, and you, you said that earlier with the rosary, it's true. Like if we don't get to, to, to pray our rosary, like we, we feel that now in the same sense, but if I don't get to the gym, right. I feel it. So, so uh, be hopeful. There's this point that, that once that habit gets in you, it will, it yeah. will not only become, it doesn't mean like you won't ever have difficulty. Same, same thing. Like sometimes like we're tired, the whole family's tired. So what we'll do is we'll just be like, let's just drive the kids to sleep and we'll just pray the rosary when we're in the car. Right. So we've got our little tricks and stuff too. <laughs> right. Uh, but that happens. So yeah, being creative. Um, but yeah, I just, I just wanted to emphasize the analogy with exercise because certainly a lot of my podcast listeners, we talk a lot about fitness. I think we'll be able to relate to that baby steps. You'll build the habit and you'll, yeah. or you know, it, you'll be at this point where it's just this thing that you, you probably couldn't even imagine not doing it or when it, for whatever reason it doesn't happen, you'll be like, Oh dang. Right. I my rosary today. Right. Mm-hmm. No, exactly. And for me, like I know myself well enough now to know when I need to pray it or when I should try to pray it and when I shouldn't. So, for example, I get very lethargic um, in the evening. So if I try and pray my rosary in the evening, I know I'm going to fall asleep. <laughs> I just know I'm going to fall asleep. So, therefore, for me, I'm not a night person. If, if I do it early in the morning, um, like I'm similar to your wife, right? I get up early. And I do a lot of prayers early because it's the quiet of the morning. It works for me. It doesn't work for some people. It's, it's difficult for them. They're, they're half asleep and, you know, trying to get up. But so find that right place for you that works for you. And if you can get into a pattern like that, I mean, you can really build those spiritual muscles, so to speak, and um, make it a part of your daily life. I mean, you know, it's a prayer that's very, you know, universal for everybody. It's the same prayer but it can be adapted according to your particular situation. Yeah, that's great. Now, one, one final thing from me and then uh, Eric, uh, I'll let you, uh, if you have any uh, final words before we um, discuss where people can grab your wonderful books. Um, everybody wants a cool rosary, Father Calloway. Where, <laughs> where, where can they get the coolest rosary? I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll admit I'm a sucker for cool rosaries too. Sometimes <laughs> I just grab the kid's plastic rosary if I, if I absolutely need to, but you know, it yeah. helps to have a kind of cool uh, rosary, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm actually designing one right now. I, oh, man, I wish I had it available right now. It won't be available until like Christmas. But um, if you want, and we'll mention where you can get the books as well. Um, in about three months, <laughs> you're going to be able to get a super cool rosary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's going to be the coolest. Yeah. yeah. So sorry about that. But it's going to be on uh, consecration to St. Joseph.org. That's the website for that. Because that's a uh, that's one website that I'm doing the whole St. Joseph stuff. So it'll be there because it's going to have a St. Joseph association. Oh. Um, yeah. So, um, but to get the books and stuff, that's fathercalloway.com. So we spell out the father, fathercalloway.com or Amazon, whatever. They got them all. The best one, you know, I got six, but if we're talking about the rosary, probably the best one is get champions of the rosary. Um, that's the most comprehensive one. But until my rosary comes out, let me tell you about my friends who's got one. It's called the Warrior Rosary. 
Mm. The, the crucifix looks like a dagger. I mean, it's, it's that cool. It, That's sweet. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't have an on me right. The one I'm holding up is not that one, but um, it's called the warrior rosary. I can't remember the, the website offhand, but check that one out because uh, both men and women, they really like it. I mean, it's, it's unique rosary for sure. Yeah. Do you, do you happen to know the website? Is it? I don't remember. It's just do Google, do it like a rose rosary warrior something. You It'll come up. Uh, I just can't remember it offhand. I wish. Oh, I is this, is it kind of styled like a world war one rosary? Um, no, that's a different one, which is also good. Yeah. But this one, it, 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 uh, it's got like battle saints associated with it. Every, uh, our father beat, I think, is a medal to that a particular saint. Wow. Um, okay, that's yeah. super cool. We will confirm it, and we'll make sure we get the right link in the show notes. Check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's that's awesome. Thank you for that recommendation. And we'll well we'll just bug you to come on the podcast again when your rosary comes out. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, real quick as we wrap up here, just wanted to hear real quick on the the luminous mysteries and why those got added. And, and also how we can encourage men to pray the rosary. Cause you mentioned in your story that it was a group of Filipino women. And a lot of times guys see older women praying the rosary and think, yeah. Oh, that must be a girl thing. Right. Uh, but really it's, it's also pretty manly. I mean, guys and girls can do it obviously. Yeah. And, and we recommend yeah. it for everyone, but just wanted to, you to cover those things in our last yeah. moments together. Yeah, I think the important thing about the men issue is to remember that the rosary was first given uh, to a man, to St. Dominic. And it was understood from the beginning of its existence to be a spiritual weapon. Um, now, a lot of people, they think they like, oh, that's, that's militant terminology. Look, don't freak out over that. I mean, we're told by St. Paul that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's got the power to overcome, you know, the hostilities, the principalities. So we're talking about a spiritual warfare here. I mean, this is what Christianity is at the heart of. Right. And we're not talking about doing violence to people. We're not talking about bloodshed or anything here. Um, we're talking about prayer. And so the Dominicans, actually, early on, they began to wear this on the left side of their religious habit. To this day, they still do. And most religious orders who have a habit, if they have a rosary with it, they wear it on their left side. Why? Because most people are right-handed. Not everybody, but most. And you unsheathe your sword from your left side. So it's been understood from the beginning that it's a spiritual weapon. And we know that nobody slays a dragon without a sword. Well, we've got a 700 headed Hydra, you know, uh, with these vices that wants to breathe flames at us. We've got a weapon to, to, to overcome this enemy. Now we've, the, the weapon has been kind of resharpened for our times in light of mysteries that are being attacked today. So quickly, the five luminous mysteries. They're an option. They're not obligatory, right? But they're a gift that a very holy Pope, St. John Paul II, gave to the church. He's not the originator of the luminous mysteries. A lot of people think that he made those up. He is not. They existed before Vatican II, because a lot of people trip out on that. Oh, I don't do anything post-Vatican II. That's crazy talk, right? It's crazy. So, mm -hmm. But they were founded by St. George Preca in Malta, and they even have a previous history in some way. Why do we have those today? Why were we given those? Think about how many people are not baptizing their children today. Tons, tons. I meet them all the time. Well, I'm going to let my child grow up and make that important decision. I'm like, that's horrible parenting 101. Mm -hmm. You feed your child, don't you? Sure you do. Because if you don't, they're going to die. You should also get them baptized because that's introducing sanctifying grace into them. It's a gateway to the greater sacrament, the Eucharist, you know. Right. So mm -hmm. we have the baptism of Jesus as just teaching us the importance of, of, of this. Then you get the wedding feast of Cana. Why on earth of all the things in the New Testament will we meditate upon that? Because marriage is under attack today. People today think that it's legit for two dudes or two women to get married. Not cool, right? Mm -hmm. At the wedding feast of Cana, it was a man and a woman. That's the only kind of marriage that Jesus is present at. So right. we need this kind of mystery today. Okay, That mm -hmm. wasn't attacked in the 13th century, even mm -hmm. by the heretics. But today it is. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the others, the call to conversion. People today don't even know what conversion is. They think that Jesus is the same as Buddha, Muhammad, you know, whatever. It, it's craziness. Um, the transfiguration also shows that, right? He is God. He's not just some guru, some nice teacher. He's God almighty, you know. Um, and then the Eucharist. You know, a survey was taken last year before the pandemic happened, just to average Catholics. 
and it was 69% of Catholics no longer believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Blessed mm -hmm. Sacrament. That is a scandal. That is horrible, right? So why do we have this mystery today? To get back to the source and summit of our faith, which is the Eucharist. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life. See, this is why we have the luminous mysteries today, because we're living in an era of darkness. We need light. Mm, wow. And that's why this ancient sword has been turned into a modern-day light saber. Yeah. I'm into all that. Yes. That was fantastic, Father Calloway. That was yeah, great. That's stuff. awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's it, Father boy. Calloway, thank you so yeah. much for coming on the podcast and sharing. And uh, for anyone that's interested, I'm about to do a series on the rosary on my podcast, just taking you all through my meditations as I pray it. And so invite you all to join that. And Father Calloway, one more time, where can people find your, your books and everything? Yeah, so I'll give you two websites, fathercalloway.com. That's where you can get all my stuff, um, fathercalloway.com. But then if you want to focus on the new thing, the St. Joseph Consecration, all that, it's consecration to consecrationtostjoseph.org. Awesome. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Father Calloway. Really appreciate this. Thank you, guys. Beloved, I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. To a production of WCAT Radio, please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.